Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about a new study that tries to investigate the origins of life. We're still not entirely sure how life started on our planet and so trying to figure out the details is really important. Anyway, let's talk about this and welcome to What The Math. And this beautiful simulation was created by the amazing Ian Webster who has a lot of really awesome visualizations and also has the world's largest catalog of dinosaur data. I've been following Ian Webster for quite a long time and do respect his work a lot and he's created some really incredible stuff out there. And what you're looking at here is the simulation of Earth as it may have been about 700 million years ago. You can check out this specific link in the description as well. And here is actually what Earth looked like uh, when the dinosaurs disappeared uh, around 66 million years ago. The actual comet that uh, hit our planet hit somewhere right here. I actually believe there's a spot right there to represent the location of the crater. But first let me take a bit of a detour and talk about this right here. This is Earth when it was about 542 maybe 600 million years ago and this is the time when Earth was populated by some of the most ridiculously looking life out there. Way cooler than dinosaurs, way more imaginative, totally alien in every way and sense. And some of these weird animals that lived during the so-called Cambrian period are so strange that for this, for example, we couldn't even figure out which way is up and where the head is. Other animals were unusual in different other ways, including um, unusual symmetry, unusual um, parts of bodies that we've never seen before. This was also the period of tremendous diversity of animals and for the most part they weren't really that big. Most of them were actually much smaller than even a typical animal today. But of all of the Cambrian animals, this here was my favorite. This is the Anomalocaris. I'm sure we'll have a video about just this creature here in the future, but to give you an idea of what it was, it's literally the T-Rex of the Cambrian. The biggest predator in the waters that was able to consume pretty much anything that was around and eventually may have evolved into something completely different. But anyway, we're getting a little bit sidetracked. Let's go back in time a few billion years. The time when Earth was still very very young, it still was very hot and had very very different atmosphere from what we have today. The time even before the first bacteria was created and before the first DNA became a thing. The time when the molecules were still kind of assembling together and we believe that some of the first molecules were actually RNA. And you might remember from your biology class that both RNA and DNA are kind of complementary, they help each other and they're also relatively similar. But we um, believe that this RNA came first and DNA evolved way way later. Which is why we also believe that the first life on Earth was probably RNA based, not so much DNA based. But here's the problem though. After receiving the collision from Theia um, and after essentially creating the moon and kind of establishing its hard shell, the atmosphere of early Earth was very likely filled with a lot of carbon dioxide, um, all kinds of sulfur compounds, possibly hydrogen. And in other words, it was not particularly productive for creating RNA molecules because they do require a relatively stable and low in oxidation or in other words, reduced atmosphere that would allow for the creation of RNA molecules that do not form well when there's a lot of oxygen around. And at the same time, um, it would require a lot of nitrogen compounds, a lot of um, very specific sulfur compounds and even things like methane that we believe may have not existed after the collision with Theia. At the same time, our planet Earth on the surface seems to indicate an unusual prevalence of a lot of different metals, specifically uh, precious metals like gold and platinum that may have appeared roughly around 4.3 billion years ago as if something just brought them. In other words, we're talking about something that may have brought those metals to our planet while at the same time possibly modifying the atmosphere, making it more reduced, making it more acceptable for RNA to form. And so this is exactly what this paper that you can find in the description below discusses. Their main idea here is that they believe something called moneta, which they um, named after the very expensive metal that it brought later, collided with Earth roughly around 4.5 billion years ago, or approximately 30 million years after the collision with Theia, and this collision created the atmosphere needed for RNA to be created, while at the same time bringing all those metals as well. 
So their um, investigation suggests that the atmosphere before the collision was not very hospitable to the creation of RNA and to, of course, creation of life. While following the collision, the atmosphere suddenly received a very large variety of materials, including uh, phosphites, that created or allowed the creation of precursors to RNA. In other words, they believe that another major collision except for Theia was necessary for us to establish these first required steps for life. Now, why couldn't all this be explained with a single collision, specifically the Theia collision that created the moon? Well, the scientists behind this paper believe that it was just too big. As a matter of fact, their current understanding is that the collision with Theia, that we believe was about Mars-sized, um, created so much destruction and released so much energy that our planet very likely sort of uh, turned into gas-like material and may have been completely molten for a very long time with a lot of the materials then sinking to the bottom of the planet while a very large gas-like cloud that formed around our planet then turned into the moon. So this was a little bit too big to bring all of these materials needed for the change of atmosphere. But a much smaller object, possibly the size of our own moon, would have enough mass to uh, cause enough destruction, but not enough destruction to completely eliminate the surface material and also to leave enough metals on the surface that would not sink, while at the same time obviously bring enough materials to turn atmosphere a little bit different and reduce it enough to create this RNA afterwards. Just to give you another visual comparison here, our planet Earth first received the collision from a Mars-like object that we refer to as Theia, and this then created the Moon. And approximately 50 million years or so later, it received another major collision from an object much smaller that they refer to as Moneta, that also sterilized our planet, destroying any signs of life that could have been there, but at the same time delivered all of these uh, materials we have on the surface now, uh, things like gold and platinum, while at the same time delivering phosphates and uh, methane and a lot of other materials that brought enough new elements into the atmosphere, allowing it to evolve RNA and then DNA and then life. But they don't think all of this happened instantly. As a matter of fact, they believe that it took about 120 million years for um, various materials to combine and to create various chemical reactions before first RNA was created here on the planet. And following this, it took about 200 million years of development, and then after about, I guess, 200 million years or so, we get our first signs of actual bacterial life on the surface of the planet. And all of this, of course, after the collision with an unusual object that they refer to as Moneta. Now, um, in terms of the size and the mass, uh, the current estimate is that it had to be much smaller than Theia. So it may have looked something like this compared to our moon, but because we also think that there were a lot of metals and a lot of other really interesting materials on the inside, it may have been um, a little bit different in density, so we don't really know what the surface looked like. For all we know, it could have actually been bigger in size, because the density could have been lower if there were more things like methane and other ices, or if there were more metals and it was a very kind of a metallic object, it would have then been a lot smaller in size compared to the moon. So here we don't really know and chances are we'll never really find out. But the fact that um, this object may have been responsible for bringing a lot of important materials for the kickstarting of life on Earth is a very important discovery. Now it's not really confirmed yet, but if the scientists behind this paper are correct, it means that this is a requirement for the creation of life. It means that for a planet anywhere out there, for an exoplanet or any other object um, in the solar system or outside of our solar system to start life, it needs to receive this collision to modify its atmosphere, to bring these extra materials for life to be able to develop. We don't know if this is something that definitely happened, but if the scientists behind this paper are onto something here, it means that we need to look for planets, and okay, I accidentally destroyed our planet here, I need to wait a little bit for it to become a little bit cooler before we can continue our discussion, and here we go. So what this paper suggests is that for Earth to create life and for other planets to create this life, there needs to be at least one major collision to bring materials for life. And so we need to start looking for objects out there that may have had these collisions or um, are very likely capable of maintaining the same atmosphere Earth used to have even without the collision. So in other words, what the scientists behind this paper suggest is that you need to have this very specific atmosphere that you can only maintain and create through very unique conditions in order for RNA, DNA and so on 
to form. It also means that if you just have an object like for example Mars that might have liquid water on the surface and that might have some sort of atmosphere, if it didn't receive these specific molecules, if it didn't receive these unusual materials later on in the creation, it may have never had life. It may have been barren this whole time. And all of this will definitely be discovered once we go to Mars and start digging around and either discover something or not discover any signs of life whatsoever. And so hopefully this hypothesis and this paper will allow us to explain what's required for life to start. At the same time, it might help us explain some of the other things we're observing on our planet that we might not be able to find anywhere else. And this of course also means that we might need to start looking for exoplanets that have received a lot of collisions for us to actually discover some sort of sign of life or at least a planet that's potentially habitable for human life as well. Anyway, once we discover all of this, we'll come back and talk about it a little bit more, but for now, that's really all we know. This paper is definitely really interesting and I encourage you to read it uh, by yourself as well. But even if you don't, uh, once we discover more and once we learn more about these ideas, I'll make sure to talk about them in some of the future videos. So do subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known before. But until then, or until we discover more, thank you, space out, and as always, bye bye.